Now, in other news, the international community at large is still primarily bashing Israeli forces for defending Israeli civilians while attacking terror groups in Gaza. Most critics drawing false moral equivalents, arguing that Israel is in the wrong because the death toll is unbalanced, as Israel has a stronger military and the Iron Dome defense system. Joining me with more, Jewish-Israeli rights activist Ruby Ruffman and fellow with the Jewish People Policy Institute and host of the Jewinst podcast, Reserves Major Dan Pfefferman. Thank you both again for being with us. Rudy, I'll start with you now. I've heard now from several leading voices, including uh, from news anchors, uh, celebrities, popular satirists like Trevor Noah and John Oliver, that Israel is guilty of responding too harshly, of disproportionality, despite Hamas's stated goal of destroying Israel and killing Jews. How do you respond? Well, you have to have the context. It's not only important to understand the what, but the why, because if you truly want to change the what, you have to understand why it's happening in the first place. The reality is that Hamas is shooting rockets onto Israeli civilians and using their civilian population, which is very dense and populated in, in Gaza, as human shields and shooting rockets from those areas. Israel is warning before they shoot back. And of course, when we look at the death tolls on either sides of civilians, even one person dying is horrible. But to take the context out of it and to manipulate it to create political ammunition to make one side good versus one side bad is allowing this conflict to continue and to continue pushing these zero-sum game realities where there's only one side that's going to succeed is also false. There is no future where Palestinians disappear. There is no future where, where, where Israelis disappear. So who's really profiting from this if not the Israeli people and the Palestinian people? Well, we have to look at also who's right now uh, in control and in power. If we look at the Palestinian Authority, they were supposed to have an election this week, which all of a sudden is no longer a conversation. Hamas all of a sudden is a favorable party uh, that before this, this uh, operation or this clash, war, conflict, whatever one wants to call it, was less relevant. Now, they're more in power. They're more uh, likely to maybe, if there's a new election, to be taken into, uh, into account. Also, the Israeli government is on its fourth election, possibly going to a fifth selection soon. No uh, coalition is being built. No government is being built. So I think we have to ask ourselves the question, who's really profiting? Is it the weapons company in, companies in the U.S. that profit from conflict? Are there medias? Uh, are there other countries? Are there people in politics? Because it's definitely not the people on the ground. All right, Dan, I'd like your response on this as well. Sure. Uh, I see this a lot, and I spend a lot of time on my platforms trying to respond to this as a former uh, military officer. I, I think, first of all, it, it comes from a, a place of, of ignorance of how militaries work, how wars are waged. And I think what we need to do is, is uh, as Israel, as Israel supporters, um, responding to this is bring the question back to them. First, we need to be talking not about uh, uh, disproportionate uh, levels of force, because this is not some kind of football match um, wh where people like Trevor Noah and John Oliver, who, who are very intelligent people um, and have huge platforms for a reason, they, they want to see some sort of football match where the score is fairly even till the end. We need to be talking about a disproportionality of intentions, not of capabilities. And here, um, once we can talk about that, it, it should be very clear who is the aggressor and who is the uh, defender in this case. And what we need to do whenever these accusations arise, is to the greatest extent possible, is ask them, what would you do differently? What do you think Israel should do differently than it's doing now? Because uh, the concept of proportionality in war and use of force has to do with using no more force than is necessary to achieve your goals. So there's clearly a disconnect, an ignorance, a misunderstanding of how militaries operate. And as of right now, the Israeli military is the only Western uh, military fighting for a democratic country um, th that's fighting on such a scale and having its military conflict in the press. And so we seem to be the only ones who have to deal with this. But this should, um, you know, we don't need to yell, we don't need to shout, we do need to engage in education and in, in dialogue with such people to talk about concepts of war, to talk about how uh, aims and strategies are achieved. And uh, if, if they're uh, so wise in this, what would they be doing differently that we aren't doing now? I certainly uh, would be glad to know. Uh, Rudy, similar, it, it seems that everyone worldwide basically has an opinion on, on this conflict, on the Israel-Palestinian conflict, even when many, if not most, seem to be missing key details or willfully ignore them, or they conflate what's going on with Gaza with what's going on with Jerusalem when they aren't necessarily conflated per se. What, what would be your message to, uh, to all the people who suddenly have an opinion on this uh, or feel very strongly on this topic even when they don't necessarily, quote unquote, have skin in the game? 
I think there, there are two different messages. There are messages for foreigners that don't have any sort of connection to the land. And the message to them is if you want to invest your energy, invest in bringing the people together, not in dividing us, not in manipulating our suffering, not in taking things out of context and trying to help us come together. Because again, like I said, there's no reality where either population disappears. So if you want to be a quote unquote activist and do something to help the people, if you truly care about Palestinians or truly care about Israelis, don't pin us against each other and don't use our pain for your own political gain. Now, if it comes to the Israelis and the Palestinians, whether living in the land or outside, if we invested our energy more in speaking to each other and understanding each other's identities, experiences, sufferings, aspirations, rather than investing it in speaking to the rest of the world to demonize the other side, which happens on both sides, then actually would we, be, we would be able to come together. And I think there's a big problem that within the Palestinian community, they haven't understood that using terrorism is not something that works. So terrorism can be used as a form of, uh, as an anti-colonial tool. So for example, a lot of Jews, Jewish militants, paramilitary groups uh, before 48 were terrorizing the British, making the price of occupation more expensive than the benefits of exploitation. And according to official British documents, they left because of Jewish terrorism. So you can use terrorism against a military group in order for them to leave. However, when you use an anti-colonial tool like terrorism against a native people, an indigenous people like the Jewish people who just happens to be 100 times stronger, they're going to respond 100 times stronger. So to intifada, to try to shake off, whether physically or intellectually or psychologically, a native people, it just will never happen. So I think we need to change tactics and have a larger conversation once this war settles of how do we proceed? How do we create a reality that actually fulfills justice for both peoples? And yes, I do think there should be a lot of responsibility held by Israel because the reality is that today Israel is in power. So although we're not responsible for why we are here, we are responsible to take that into consideration in order to build something to move forward. All right. Now, Rudy, Dan, thank you both so much for being with us.